Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast. I'm Irene Itchon, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communication. Hi, Ro. How are you? Fine, thank you. And we also have a special guest, Lance Azumi, who's our Senior Director of Education at PRI. Very popular with our uh, our listeners. Always great to be here with you, Ro and Tim. So we've got Lance today because he's got a new book out later this month on homeschooling, and he's also been following the, the school reopenings very closely. So he's going to be our special guest. But before that, we've got some polls to talk about, right, Tim? That's right. You know, we are, uh, it, it's almost over. By the time you're listening to this, it may be over, but our, our recall election and my birthday celebration all rolled into one. Are, uh, are just about done. And, um, you know, the debate has been, what's the turnout going to be? And we've seen a lot of back and forth. And we've seen an interesting phenomenon uh, develop. Um, it seems that Democrats are waking up and coming home, casting a, a, a no vote on the recall. Democrats are returning their ballots at a much stronger clip by mail, and uh, Republicans, it seems, from early, early numbers are returning their ballots more in these in-person voting centers that are have been set up uh, around the state over the uh, the past week or so. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, like we had in 2020, are you going to have a mirage in the uh, early election returns where, you know, maybe it is heavily skewed one way or the other based on which parties uh, ballots are being counted uh, early? I don't know. We, we could be in for um, a, a, an interesting night or an interesting few days uh, after the election, you know, to see just how did turnout um, shake out. But the most recent polls that we're seeing, um, there was one from YouGov I saw the other day that showed um, the no vote is at 56 percent now. Um, so it seems uh, pretty clear that, um, you know, the yes side is a real uphill battle. Uh, to win on the 14th. Lance, what's your take on the electorate? Yeah, well, you know, I, I still think that, um, you know, the polls may or may not, I think I think that uh, may not really be gauging intensity uh, still. You know, it's uh, uh, people telling pollsters how they think about an issue like the recall uh, is one thing. But, uh, you know, who's actually going to go out and actually go to the polls, you know, uh, in a election that's on uh, in a time period that people aren't used to going to the polls. And so therefore, you know, are the people who are motivated to recall Governor Newsom, uh, are, are they more intense in that motivation than the people who are uh, want to keep him and want to uh, vote no on the recall? You know, uh, I, I, I still think that there's more intensity with uh, the pro-recall side. You know, again, though, you know, the, the governor spent a lot of money on ads. And so uh, that was having an effect in uh, ramping up the intensity of his base. I mean, certainly the uh, commercials that he's running are geared to uh, motivating his base. And, you know, maybe they may be having that effect. But I, I think that the one joker in the pack is still the intensity issue. Well, I got to say, I didn't, as Tim knows, um, I didn't get my ballot uh and it was never sent to me. And I, I actually, this first time in my whole voting life that I emailed um, Vote LA, which is where I'm supposed to get an extra ballot. And they did, Tim, end up sending me a new ballot. So I don't know if I would have paid that much attention, you know, if it had been some off year election. After all, you know, we're we're a pretty blue state here. And that's um, kind of an anecdote that you're hearing a lot is that, you know, with all of the, it was summertime, uh, with all the focus on TV with the Olympics and the fires around the state and Afghanistan, you know, that's been the big question is, are people really connecting with this election? It, are we going to get a broader turnout or is it going to be a lower turnout, you know, that would benefit more the yes on the recall side? But it's pretty clear and it, it's not just the polling it's the actual raw numbers of who is returning uh, their ballots democrats are returning their ballots at a faster clip and at a greater um, numbers than even their massive registration advantage in the state so it's going to take a huge in-person return at this point to um, even make it a nail biter so we will see the parties at my house on election night 
<laughs> and I can attest to the fact that Tim's election night parties are terrific. Well, if uh, voters are somewhat lukewarm about uh, this recall election, we know an issue where they are absolutely not, and that is back to school. Lance, let's start with where we've been for months, a debate reopening of our schools to in-person instruction. Seems like most kids are returning to the classroom as normal, but teachers unions are demanding that students wear masks and be fully vaccinated. So where do things stand now um, as the new school year is beginning? Do you think there's a chance that we could see schools revert to hybrid learning or even worse, if the unions get their way? And, and where do you where do public health experts stand on classroom mask wearing and students' vaccines these days? Well, well, if you look at the uh, debate, let's say on masks, it's really a blue state versus red state issue. Uh, blue states like California, where we all, all live, Illinois, New Jersey, heavily blue states like that, you know, they're mandating masks for students uh, in this school year. But if you look at red states like Texas, Arizona, and Florida, they've actually prohibited school districts from requiring masks. So the question really should, though, revolve around what is the, you know, science really say about the effectiveness of mask wearing? I mean, everybody, you know, on both sides uh, want to point or at least uh, use the phrase, you know, that their decisions are based on the science, that science is leading their decisions. But, you know, really, what does the science say? And it's really interesting, actually, because if you look at some of the recent studies that have come out, they've actually been against masking students. For So, for example, the CDC, they came out with a study recently, which looked at 90,000 students uh, in, two, in 2020, and they found that masking students was ineffective in stopping COVID. Now, what's interesting about that, though, is that as important as that conclusion is, is that New York Magazine actually did an analysis of this CDC study. And what they found is that this conclusion that masking was ineffective uh, in in terms of stopping COVID for students uh, was actually buried. It was not actually included in the summary of the study itself. And, you know, one scientist says that what that is called is basically uh, filtering by uh, in the drawer, you know, is that you put an important conclusion in a drawer and you filter it out at the site so that most lay people, certainly the news media, they never, uh, you know, talk about it because it's not actually in the summary of the study. And it was therefore buried. But that's an incredibly important conclusion that this study uh, came to is that masking was ineffective. And, you know, if you look at other studies done, let's say by John Hopkins University came out with a recent study that looked at, you know, well, what percentage of pediatric COVID deaths have occurred in this country? Well, they found out that 100% of the pediatric COVID deaths occurred in children with a pre-existing condition. Zero percent occurred in kids who didn't have uh, some kind of pre- uh, pre-existing condition. And so therefore you had, you know, tons more uh, children dying of pneumonia than you did even of COVID, even if they had a pre-existing uh, condition. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the data on uh, mask wearing itself. But what about, you know, in states like California, for example, where you have mask mandates for students, regardless of what the scientific data says, well, there's more scientific data that actually looks at uh, the, basically the the health risks of forcing children to wear masks. So the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, just recently came out with a study that concluded that children should not be forced to wear a mask because mask wearing itself causes increased carbon dioxide levels in both inhaled and exhaled airs, exhaled air inside the mask. And what these researchers found, and they, these researchers uh, that published this article in the American Medical Association Journal, they were from Germany and Austria, and they found that the amount of carbon dioxide being breathed in by children was up to 14 times higher than allowed by German law. So 14 times higher than uh, what the law uh, put as a ceiling is what the kids were breathing in, uh, in terms of their carbon dioxide, because they were uh, wearing masks. So you know, what they also found is that 70% of children experiencing adverse health effects, they could trace it to the wearing of masks and the excess 
carbon dioxide. So, you know, the mask wearing, I mean, it's bad for all kinds of reasons. You know, first it's ineffective, but also too, uh, forcing kids to wear it actually will cause health problems in and of itself. Uh, now, regarding the vaccine issue, the evidence, you know, um, is, is mixed. Uh, but like, for example, the, we've all heard that the CDC now recommends that uh, children 12 and older, you know, should probably get vaccinated. But, you know, there are other researchers that uh, have come out, you know, very strongly and said that that's actually not true. Uh, you had a, a very prominent article in the Wall Street Journal not long ago by medical professors from Yale and UCLA who said that the vaccine itself, based upon uh, the data that they analyzed, you know, is associated with higher rates of children's health problems, such as heart inflammation. And they concluded that, and this is a quote from them, that the risks of COVID-19, uh, the risks of a COVID-19 vaccine may outweigh the benefits for certain low-risk populations, such as children, young adults, and people who have recovered from COVID-19, unquote. You know, so what's the answer? Well, like in so many other education problems, the solution really is school choice. And I think Florida Governor Ron DeSantis really has the right policy. In Florida, parents who want their children, for example, to uh, be in a school that uh, requires masks are now eligible for a school choice scholarship that will allow them to attend a private school that allows masking of students. So states like Arizona, Tennessee, and Arkansas, they're all considering similar school choice ideas. And I really think that, uh, you know, instead of having this heavy handed top down uh, government response to uh, these issues that are often undercut by the scientific evidence that we should really give uh, parents as much leeway and choices as possible to make the decision that best fits the needs of their kids. Lane, she recently wrote a blog on our Right by the Bay that takes a look at a couple of new reports on student learning laws due to the pandemic. So what does the latest research tell us and what can be done to help these kids overcome what is essentially 18 months of lost learning time? Well, you know, the, the, the recent results are you know, pretty bad and very, very troubling, Tim. Uh, so the most recent study that's come out is by McKinsey and Company, which is the very well-known research firm here in uh, the U.S. And what they found is that looking at students nationally, that uh, kids have lost uh, five months learning in math and four months learning in reading. But if you look at uh, you know, special populations or specific demographics, the results are even worse. So if you look at schools where the majority of the student population is African-American, the learning loss in those schools is six months. And if you look at schools where the majority of the population are from low income families, uh, then the learning loss is seven months. So you're seeing this huge amount of learning loss generally, but then you're also seeing the achievement gap widening even more, uh, you know, because of COVID and uh, all the uh, school closures that have gone on during the uh, COVID pandemic. And so how do you make up for those types of losses? Uh, well, what the Biden administration has done is they've proposed a huge education stimulus spending plan, which is about $120, $130 billion. And 20% uh, of that is supposed to address learning losses. But, you know, when you look at how that 20%, and you're talking there for anywhere from like, like 35 to uh, 40 uh, billion dollars, uh, and you look at how that money is being spent, uh, it, it, it gives us a lot of pause as to whether that money is going to do any good in terms of making up for this uh, learning loss. Uh, you know, re researchers from Georgetown University uh, analyzed this uh, part of the stimulus program that was supposed to go to learning uh, to address learning loss of kids. And what they found actually, what well, there were lots of money uh, being spent by school district as thank you payments to teachers, adding on new staff and status quo spending. And there was very little money that was actually going to innovation and spending targeted at students to address the actual learning losses they were suffering from and which this spending plan was supposed to be focused on. So I recently wrote an op-ed piece on Biden's spending plan, and I actually gave him a D for his education report card. And 
I, I, did, I, I said I didn't give him an F because there was still room for him to do even worse in the future. Um, but I got a response actually from a Los Angeles Teachers Union official who, uh, to my op-ed piece, and he claimed that union supported top-down measures like reducing class size and adding more teachers would actually help children. But you know, my, res- my response to it, and I wrote a letter to the editor to um, publication called Cal Matters here and said, you know, how does this teacher's union official, how does he know if that's the best way for students to make up for their learning losses? He doesn't know because he's not the parent. Uh, it's better to have a bottom-up cho- uh, set of choices for parents and, and their kids. So if you look at Biden's $120 billion uh, in his, uh, uh, of education spending in his stimulus plan, that works out to about $2,500 per child in the United States. So it'd be best to give that money to parents and their kids through an education savings account so parents could use that money for, let's say, individual tutoring or specialized services that would really, again, best meet the needs of their kid, especially considering the learning losses they've suffered uh, during the COVID school closures. And even if you look at California here, uh, you know, in our state budget, if you were to take just the $1 billion in the state budget for more school staff, plus the $5 billion dollars for summer school and after school programs, that alone would work out to about $1,000 per student here in California. And why not give parents that power to spend that money on the individual needs of their children? Uh, And that would be much better than relying on a public school system that had actually failed the vast majority of children here in California, even before COVID. Well, Lance, a few years ago, we did this study, you did this study on middle-class schools and across the board in middle-class schools in California and in many states, the one thing that we found was the underperformance of math among many, many of these middle-class students. But now we've got this new thing that's that's even worse, which is called woke math or social justice math. So what exactly is being proposed about this social justice math? And what does the research show uh, us about how it has impacted student math learning where this curriculum has been implemented? This is the kind of thing that when you live in California, stuff like this happens. It's like, you know, you take a situation which is not great and, you know, the California's uh, policymakers decide to try and make it worse. So, you know, it is true that uh, math performance in California uh, has not been the greatest, uh, you know, even uh, amongst middle class and more affluent students. But if you look at what was recently proposed uh, and put before the State Board of Education, this so-called woke California math curriculum framework, you know, that would be, that would be even worse. It'd be a, like a terrible solution to a, you know, difficult issue. And so what this woke proposed woke California math curriculum framework would do, it was that it would make math teachers develop sociopolitical consciousness of their students. It would force students to solve problems that result in social inequality and push teachers to take a social justice perspective and reject math as a neutral discipline, which is all just shocking. But really, actually, and one, this is one of the things that uh, didn't uh, get as much publicity, but really is probably one of the worst things about this proposed framework is that the goal of the framework would be to force all students to take a one-size-fits-all, lowest common denominator math uh, uh, set of courses until the 11th grade. And that mean, what that means is that talented math students would not be able to be accelerated, students would be, wouldn't be grouped based upon their ability, and it would be next to impossible for talented math students to take calculus in the 12th grade. Now, the, pe- the people who are the proponents of this woke math curriculum you know, point to San Francisco as a um, school district that has, you know, implemented this type of program. And yes, they have implemented, uh, you know, this type of woke one size with uh, fits all math curriculum. But this approach has been a total disaster in San Francisco. The percentage of students in San Francisco taking calculus has dropped by double digits. There was a 20% drop in students receiving an A or B in algebra. Low-income students and English language learners perform lower on math tests. You know, all of these things, you know, uh, underscore what a disaster this proposed state math curriculum would be like if you were to, you know, impose this on all districts in California. And that's why, you know, more than 700 prominent mathematicians and education leaders, well, including myself, 
signed an open letter against this proposed math framework. And I also advise Congresswoman Young Kim on her letter opposing this math framework, which was eventually signed by many of her California congressional colleagues. And, you know, one of the, you know, we don't often have good things to report, uh, good outcomes here in California, but there is uh, at least a temporary happy ending to this, that um, the State Board of Education has postponed considering this uh, woke math framework because of the pushback that they've received uh, uh, from on so many fronts. And hopefully it will die the death it deserves, but we're going to have to be very vigilant to see if, uh, you know, this is going to be like a vampire coming out of the coffin. So the legislature just adjourned for the year, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief. And thanks to your efforts, PRI had a major victory this year in stopping a very controversial proposal that would have denied full education funding to thousands of homeschool students. So tell us about this bill and and how this uh, defeat will benefit these students and all students. And uh, in addition, what were some of the other bills affecting charter schools or school choice or other education areas that you were following this session? Well, thanks, Tim. Yeah, you know, that victory involved uh, for PRI involved uh, AB 1316, which was a California Teachers Association supported bill that would have torpedoed charter schools. It would have discriminated against students in independent study programs at charter schools by reducing their funding while fully funding similar students at regular public schools. So for example, a student at a district run virtual school where the instruction takes place remotely and online would have received full funding, but students at non-classroom based charter schools who also take their classes remotely and online would not receive full funding. So this is just outright discrimination and it totally undercuts the long running principle here in California that funding must follow the child to the school in which they are enrolled. Uh, And, you know, so it's important, I think, for our listeners to remember that during this time period when this uh, bill was being discussed a few months ago, that the proponents of AB 1316 were pushing to cut funding to the very type of school, these non-classroom based charter schools that often specialize in the type of remote learning that was so needed during the pandemic. These were the schools that uh, the proponents of AB 1316 were trying to undercut. So uh, why would why would we want to target these schools at the very moment when we needed exactly these types of schools? It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, of course, it's actually, you know, in, in this, I guess if you think about it from a special interest point of view, like the teachers union, it does make sense because the success of these non-classroom based charter schools uh, during the pandemic are what worried the teachers union. So I actually talked to the head of one non-classroom based charter school, and she said that because of the COVID pandemic, her school had an admissions lottery for the first time in its history because they had so many kids who are applying for the school. And again, yet AB 1316 would have discriminated against the choices made by parents who wanted to send their children to her charter school. Now, thankfully, AB 1316 was pulled back after an outcry from parents. And also, again, you know, uh, based upon this influential article that I wrote on this bill, uh, right before efforts to pass it collapsed. So, you know, uh, it is a victory for common sense and also for Pacific Research Institute. And, you know, we're very proud of that. And it's, again, an indication that uh, we really have impact here in this state, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, it is uh, such a overwhelmingly uh, difficult, uh, politically uh, difficult state in which to work. But, you know, to the second part of your question, um, Tim, you know, in terms of bills that are kind of rattling around at the last minute in the state legislature, there's a budget trailer bill that has language on funding for independent study in regular public schools. Now, you know, just uh, f- uh, for the uh, edification of our listeners, independent study at regular public schools is like having public school at home. So under independent study, every family has to sign a contract outlining academic expectations and teachers assign work equivalent to the time students would have learned that uh, uh, those uh, uh, subjects in person and teachers would have to track and then grade that work. Now, it's estimated that because of COVID, you know, you, there are a lot of parents 
who are going to opt for independent study, but school districts are worried that they won't have enough teachers to oversee all of these independent study students. And, you know, so far, you know, again, with so many other things in the regular public school system, the experience of independent study students in the public schools during COVID has really been mixed with many parents complain that there are oftentimes very few assignments given their kids. There was a lack of rigor to those assignments and sometimes no work was given at all. And so that's why, and then I, this is, I think, a good segue into talking about my upcoming book. That's why I recommend that instead of doing public school at home, parents should really consider homeschooling their children where they have much, much more control over the curriculum and learning of their children, children and really ensuring that uh, they receive the type of education that they want their kids to receive. So Lance, let's, let's chat about your new book. It's going to be out later this month. It's called The Homeschooling Boom, and it explores this fast-growing yet often misunderstood school choice option. Uh, you bust a lot of myths in this book, so give our listeners a preview of what they can expect to, to learn when they read your book. Well, thanks, Ro. Uh, I think this new book uh, that will be coming out later this month called The Homeschool Boom. I think it's, um, I love all the books I've written, but I really, really enjoyed writing this book because I think it's such an important topic and it's so incredibly timely uh, given uh, what we're seeing happening in the United States because there is, as the title says, there is a homeschool boom going on in America. And if you look, for example, at the most uh, recent census, U.S. Census Bureau numbers from earlier this year, you know, if you, uh, what they found is that the proportion of homeschoolers uh, in the United States has dramatically increased. So the households that had been homeschooling in spring of 2020 was about 5% of households in America. By fall of 2020, and, you know, that's only a few months, 11%, more than double of uh, American households were homeschooling their kids. And the increase was, you know, even more stark uh, when you looked at certain demographics in certain states. So amongst African Americans, you found that the proportion of homeschooling households jumped from 3% to 16%, a five-fold increase in the proportion of homeschoolers in um, the African American community. Amongst Hispanics, you had uh, originally 6% of Hispanics were homeschooling their kids. Uh, now you have 12%. In red states, like in, in Florida, you went from 5% to 18%. In blue states, you went from, like New York, you had uh, the, number, the homeschooling uh, population go from 1% of uh, families to 10%, uh, you know, 10 fold increase. And uh, what the Bureau specifically uh, underscored in its survey of uh, households was they wanted to ensure that people knew that there was a difference between doing public school at home, which I mentioned in uh, the previous uh, question, and actually homeschooling, which uh, does give parents control, actual control over the learning of their kids. And, you know, what I found in this book and doing the research for this book is that homeschooling has really become one of the most diverse education movements in the country. And you have parents from different racial, political, and religious backgrounds who are now deciding to homeschool their kids. And this book is designed to highlight this diversity, but especially to dispel the myths about who homeschools their children and why they homeschool. So for example, I tackle the myth that only white parents homeschool their children. And I uh, profile different, uh, you know, uh, parents who homeschool their uh, kids who are from minority communities. So for example, I tell the story of Magda Gomez, who's an immigrant from Mexico, who decided to homeschool her daughters after they were um, bullied and attacked at their regular public school. And she's now an activist in the Hispanic community, promoting homeschooling and informing parents about their educational choices. And so I also uh, profile Demetria Zinga, who has been listed as one of the top 10 African-American homeschool bloggers in the country. And Demetria was able to use homeschooling to try different curricula and learning methods for her daughters to meet their individual needs. And she says that many African-American parents have decided to homeschool because they want to share values and pass on their heritage that they believe that can't be done in the regular public schools. 
So let's build upon that uh, myth-busting theme. Let's talk about a few. Um, first, you have a chapter where you profile parents who, again, contrary to popular belief, are successfully educating their kids with special needs at home. So how are they doing it? And what can other parents with special needs kids who are thinking about homeschooling learn from their example? Well, you know, I think this is one of the important myths to bust uh, in my book is that I think a lot of people, uh, when they think about kids with special needs, they almost automatically think that the only way those kids can be educated is in a conventional school setting and that there's no way that uh, the average parent could um, uh, teach their kids at home. And actually, the complete opposite is the case. And that's why I interviewed a number of parents uh, about how they have successfully educated their uh, special needs children at home. Uh, for example, I interviewed Carrie Carlson, who is, uh, homes who is homeschooling her son who has autism and dyslexia. Prior to her son's diagnosis, he had like really visible learning problems, such as having a hard time reading. And what was his public school's response? It was to put him in the lowest performing group in his classroom, which consisted mostly of non-English speaking students. And Carrie's son is an English fluent, uh, is, is English fluent and doesn't speak any other language. And so Carrie asked, how is it that this is even helping him? It doesn't make any sense. And no, it doesn't make any sense. So not surprisingly, her son was really miserable and would pretend to have sicknesses in order to avoid going to school. And he even told her one day that, you know, before he was supposed to go on the school bus, that he thought he actually had prostate cancer and wanted to stay home for the day. So Carrie uh, finally decided to homeschool her son. And she was able to, therefore, follow her neurologist advice in teaching her son. And because, for example, her son had trouble reading and decoding, uh, she followed her neurologist's advice and transitioned him into using audiobooks, and he was able to devour books on tape. So, for example, using audiobooks, her son was able to go through and comprehend the entire three-volume trilogy of The Lord of the Rings at the age of eight. Now, I love The Lord of the Rings. It's one of my very favorite uh, works of fiction, but I wasn't able to get through it until a lot later in my life compared to her son. And that trilogy is a thousand pages long and quite complicated, but he loved it using audiobooks. And he was able to uh, access uh, that book using something that would not have been available to him in a regular public school. And Carrie says that, you know, he's now one of probably the most well-read dyslexic students out there. And, you know, she was able to do this, uh, you know, for his learning in all across the board and, you know, fit the learning to his style. And so, you know, she was able to work at a slower pace with him uh, and uh, because uh, her son needed to have things slow. But he, but when he would work, he would be able to do things very intensively so that he would absorb the amount of uh, material that he would have gotten, let's say, you know, in a regular public school. But it was just done in a way that would really fit his learning style. And, uh, you know, he was able to then take breaks when he needed to play with his dog for a few minutes, but then go back to this intensive uh, uh, type of learning. And he, it, it really worked out. And Carrie believes that if her son was forced to be in this one size fits all type of regular public school situation, he would have ended up suffering from depression and anxiety. And, you know, if he was actually forced to go through, let's say a regular public uh, high school, uh, she said that I think that he would just have continued to spiral down. So keeping him out of that environment allowed him to grow on his own and allowed him to find things that he loves and that he's passionate about. So, you know, as a result, she says that he's willing to work hard and advocate for himself. And I think that's hugely positive. And I don't think that he would have done that in a regular high school environment. And so I think that really encapsulates, you know, her story encapsulates you know, why even in an area like special needs where so many people, again, believe that, uh, you know, th that uh, these kids have to be in a, pub a regular public school, that actually because of this individual tailoring to the needs of the child, that actually homeschooling it many times is the best solution for these kids and that they will end up learning much better uh, as Carrie's uh, son was able to do.
Now, a lot of parents became homeschool parents overnight because of the pandemic, but the many complaints you heard from parents had more to do with traditional public schools being unable to adapt than um, anything really about homeschooling itself. Uh, You write in your book that contrary to the myth, there are a ton of resources available to help parents homeschool their kids. So talk about some of these resources. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, for uh, parents who are homeschooling in our day and age, it's uh, so much easier to homeschool now than, let's say, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when homeschooling was first getting off the ground, really, in a significant way in the United States. Um, Because, you know, you have the internet, you have online resources that are available for parents that are are very readily available for parents and which are free. So, uh, for example, online curricula. There are dozens and dozens of uh, free online curricula available for parents. Like, for example, uh, one of my favorite curriculum is uh, the is Core Knowledge, uh, which is a great K through 12 curriculum uh, in all the basic subjects. Uh, does it in a, a really well done and very effective and well proven way. And that uh, curriculum, Core Knowledge curriculum, is available uh, free of charge from the Core Knowledge Foundation. So parents just have to go online and access that curriculum from the Core Knowledge Foundation and they're ready to go if that's the type of curriculum that they believe will suit their child. But there are lots of other types of curricula out there online that uh, they can choose from, you know, based upon whatever needs their child has. There's also other online resources. Uh, like For example, if kids are having, um, you know, deficiencies in particular uh, areas of learning. Uh, one of the things I recommend is uh, actually uh, from, of all places, the United States Army, uh, there's a program that the Army offers called March to Success. It's March with the number two, success, all one word, March to Success. And what that does is that it, uh, it, it's, it, compensates or it remediates kids who are having problems in uh, English or math or science. And they go to uh, this uh, website um, for March to Success that the Army man- maintains. And, you know, they take diagnostic assessments. You know, they, uh, the program finds out where students are weak and they are able to interactively provide remedial instruction for that uh, child. And, you know, uh, they're able to do that, you know, of course, wherever, you know, at home, you know, at school, uh, wherever they happen to be. But it's a great resource for uh, homeschooling parents who are having problems with their child in, let's say, certain uh, areas, especially in the STEM subjects. But, you know, besides, you know, the online tools that are available, you know, there are also lots of groupings now that are available for, um, uh, homeschoolers to take advantage of. You have homeschool co-ops, which are voluntary uh, organizations of local parents who may come together to offer, uh, you know, uh, socialization opportunities for kids who uh, uh, maybe offer some uh, types of uh, instruction. You know, maybe parents may take it upon themselves to uh, instruct kids or teach kids one day a week or something like that. But these uh, voluntary homeschool co-ops are great resources for parents. And so and they really put uh, to lie that myth that uh, homeschoolers are just uh, people who are sitting at the kitchen table with their kid 24-7 and that they have no interaction with the outside world. And that's totally not the case, especially in this day and age where there are these opportunities through homeschool co-ops, through other homeschool groupings uh, to uh, be able to uh, have your kids have those types of socialization experiences that a lot of people, you know, uh, still uh, believe are not available to homeschoolers. Another common misperception is that parents who homeschool their kids are just replicating a traditional classroom experience in their home. But you write in your book about parents who are embracing flexibility in educating their kids at home and this concept that's called unschooling. So talk about this and how homeschooling is perhaps one of the learning models that is best suited to meet the individual needs of students. So uh, now this is a really interesting chapter in my book. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of people think that uh, homeschoolers, you know, all they're doing is just replicating the structure of a conventional school in their at their kitchen table or wherever in their home. And so that that is totally not the case. Yes, you know, uh, some 
homeschooling programs that are available or homeschooling curricula out there that are you know more structured but the, the homeschooling really in terms of the learning methods that are available uh, out there you know really span the gamut from more structured types of uh, uh, curricula let's say to things such as unschooling unschooling is really where you allow children to have to be the driver of their own education and so it, it takes into account their passions their interests and allows them to run with those interests and to uh, increase their motivation to learn and therefore develop a love of learning as opposed to having things shoved down their throat by a top-down teacher in a classroom. And so I profile a uh, uh, family in, in England, in Oxford, England, actually, and uh, they have uh, unschooled their kids. Uh, they originally started off in the United States. They're Americans. They started off in Massachusetts unschooling their children, but now are uh, based in uh, the UK. And the mom who I talked to, she said that uh, the way she unschools her children is that she does have uh, some structured math and reading uh, instruction for maybe like an hour a day or something like that. But the rest of the time is really devoted to what the kids are interested in. And this is especially good for kids who are, um, let's say, uh, I mean, who have interests that would never be addressed in a regular public school classroom. So for example, I interviewed her, her son, uh, a, a wonderful boy named Justin. And Justin told me, that, and now he's 12 years old in uh, the sixth grade. And he said that if he were in a regular public school classroom, he would probably be reading books about superheroes. And he doesn't want to read books about superheroes. What Justin told me he was reading right now, and this just blew my mind. So he said that he was reading uh, the, the book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, The Gulag Archipelago, which is like, incredibly great book i mean a historic book but is incredibly dense i i bought that when i was in college and i could get through only about three pages and he's like reading uh, this incredibly dense book because that's what he's interested in he's interested in learning about the soviet prison camp system under communism and he's not interested in superheroes and so this unschooling method allows him the opportunity to uh, run with what he's interested in and be able to then, you know, uh, go as far and as fast as he wants to. And he's not restrained and constricted by a set curriculum. And that's why for kids like that, who really have, uh, you know, specific interests that are really a passion for them, this type of unschooling, which allows them to really take the reins of their own education is a good fit. Now that's not a good fit for everybody. But that's the great thing about unschool, uh, about homeschooling, is that there are so many different ways to homeschool your child, and it really depends on what really best fits their needs. Unschooling fits for certain types of kids, and you know, uh, one last thing about uh, this family in the UK is that you know they're able to take advantage of all the incredible historical um, resources available in the UK. You know, just a walk down to the museum, and they can see you know, um, you know thousands of years of, uh, uh, of history right before their eyes. And it's, uh, I mean, something that you know, probably isn't available to kids who are in uh, regular public schools. So uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a very encouraging development, uh, you know, this particular movement, I think. So as with school choice in general, homeschooling is under attack from academics and, and politicians alike. So what are some of these opponents of homeschooling saying about it? And, and what are some policy reforms that elected officials in, in California and other states should be considering to ensure homeschooling and, and more school choice options are available to all students? Well, you know, I think, Ro, that uh, if you look at the gamut of anti-homeschooling arguments that are being put forward, I mean, they, they range, uh, right? They, they range from kind of just, the, again, the ham-fisted union argument, which basically says, I mean, for example, the National Education Association has adopted, you know, resolution after resolution opposing homeschooling uh, because they simply say that uh, children are best educated with a credential teacher in front of them. And so, you know, as if we're supposed to simply take their word for it that that's true. When actually, if you look at the studies that have been done comparing homeschoolers with 
reg, uh, uh, with students from regular public schools, you find that the overwhelming majority of those studies show that homeschoolers outperform uh, students who are uh, from regular public schools. But, you know, uh, so the teachers unions just make this ar uh, really unsubtle argument that the research really, uh, you know, undercuts. But there are other arguments that are being pushed out there right now, too. Uh, one of the biggest, most publicized recent opponents of homeschooling is a Harvard professor named Elizabeth Bartholet. And she has uh, tried to focus on this issue, or at least this claim, that homeschooling allows for greater abuse of children, uh, physical abuse of children. And actually, if you look at the data, it turns out that uh, homeschoolers have a much lower level of abuse than the general population as a whole. And if you look at uh, one of the uh, areas where there is a significant amount of abuse, it actually does take place in schools. You know, students are uh, opting for homeschooling and parents are opting for homeschooling. One of the key reasons is because of the fear of, uh, for the uh, safety of their kids in the regular public schools. So, you know, whether it's kids being bullied on the playground or attacked in the hallways, or even in, unfortunately, too many cases, uh, kids being abused by their teachers themselves, you know, all of that combines to, um, you know, cause parents to want to take their kids out of the regular public schools and homeschooling because it's a much safer, protective environment for these uh, kids. And so, you know, these arguments by people like this Harvard professor, I mean, are really based on emotion and on people's uh, uh, assumptions and prejudices, not on uh, real research data. Also, too, I th uh, you know, in, in terms of going forward, and not only do we have to combat these types of arguments, uh, but also, too, I think that we need to look for positive solutions that will help greater numbers of homeschooling families, or at least those parents who are considering homeschooling. And I think that one of the things that policymakers should do is to take a look at states, let's say, like Florida, which offers a whole gamut of uh, school choice programs. And one of those programs uh, allows parents to take uh, education savings account uh, dollars, which are state funded um, dollars in accounts set aside for parents, that are able to take those state funded dollars and use them for home education expenses. This makes it a lot easier for parents to be able to, let's say, uh, meet the expense needs that they would have or, gar or come up with as they're homeschooling their kids. Here in California, uh, uh, charter schools uh, often, well, one growing area of charter schools here in California is the homeschool academies associated with charter schools. And uh, one of the advantages that enrolling your kid in a homeschool academy where you, you might send your kid there for one or two days, for example, or and then have the rest of the time actually homeschooling your kid in your home is that uh, it offers uh, a lot of um, curricula and other sorts of things that the is provided by the school and you don't actually have to either purchase it or find it on your own. So um, I think that those are the types of things that we should be looking at in terms of making things easier for parents to be able to homeschool their kids because you're getting a lot more parents. As I mentioned with the Census Bureau numbers, you're getting a lot more parents who are going to be looking seriously at homeschooling their kids because the public schools are simply failing to uh, educate their children either academically or, you know, um, based upon these health, uh, health mandates uh, in the way that parents want to see their kids educated. And that I think a lot of parents now are at the point where they are willing to take control of their kids' education and bring them home and, you know, have the type of learning that will really best meet their individual needs. Thanks so much, Lance. That was a great conversation. And for listeners who want to uh, check out and buy the homeschool book, it'll be available later in September or early October. So it, it's a terrific book. We've read it several times and we hope you buy it. Thanks again, Lance. Thank you, Ro. Thanks, Tim. And one more thing, um, if you want to meet Lance in the flesh and also Tim, please consider coming to our gala 
Um, this year, it's uh, October 2nd in San Francisco. That's a Saturday. And our keynote speaker is Mark Levin. It's also the 30th anniversary of our president and CEO, Sally Pipes, at the helm of PRI. And, uh, and another treat, this is only for our listeners who will know this, another treat is that our board member, Judge Dan Kolke, who is a former judge here in California, uh, is going to sing a tune. He sang at the Glee Club back uh, when in his Stanford days, and um, we convinced him to, uh, to sing a tune for us. So please come in and join us. Thanks again. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.